make this big. I think you can see, you can see the full screen of my slides. Yep. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to talk about pain solutions, you know, and talk about mind body approaches to pain. Um, you know, I just, pain and suffering really affect our lives, don't they? Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. And <laughs> of course we want the, why wouldn't we want the pleasure? Um, I put this quote in here, mostly for my students that I work with. You know, I think this is a common thing for physicians. The patients stop coming back. And so the, the practitioner says, hey, my patients have gotten better, but they really got, gave up. So um, I just want to talk about the definitions of pain. I know that we are familiar with this, but what are we talking about? Um, the word pain initially meant to impose a penalty. And think about that, fault, offense, violation. You know, with pain, we often react to it so strongly. But what is the original purpose of pain? The original purpose of pain is not just to keep us humble, but the original purpose of pain is really to protect us. For instance, if you're hiking out on the mountain and you twist your ankle and you don't feel pain, you're gonna keep going and you'll probably damage your ankle. And so it is about protection. I'm sorry, I just, I love these cartoons. It's like, wait a minute here, Mr. Crumbly, maybe it isn't a kidney stone after all. Um, you know, one of the things I like about naturopathic medicine is one of the principles of naturopathic medicine is treating the cause. If you have chronic headaches, we could just give you medications for headaches, but what if you're eating something you're allergic to? Or what if, like many of us, my practice now, my teaching schedule at past year and my private practice is all remote. I'm spending so much time on Zoom. And what if it is simply our posture? And I can't tell people enough how much posture, <laughs> I saw some people change their posture right now because I can see you, uh, you change your posture. How much of our posture is impacting our pain, our neck muscles. And I could go into that. That could be a whole topic of just treating posture. Um, but how much of our, what if our posture is causing our headaches? Or what if it's we had lack of sleep? If we just treat the symptom, the pain, we're not really learning about the cause. And so that's really important. When we talk about pain, it's an unpleasant sensory experience. That's what it is. That's what the International Association of Study of Pain says. But there's something called the interoceptive system. And this is where we're getting all this feedback. We're getting this feedback from our body and it goes up to the brain. And that's important to note. Pain is not just simply what happens in the tissues, what happens in our body. It's also the signal that happens in the brain. So pain then is an unpleasant experience but it might not have anything to do with actual tissue or organ or nerve damage, but it's connected to our sensory system. So it's alerting our brain. It's saying, hey, something's going on and it's a perception. And when we perceive it, it generates a response. So how many of you, let me ask it this way and you don't, it's a rhetorical question. How many of you are so nervous about talking about your pain with a provider or something because you're afraid they're going to say it's all in your head. How many times, oh good, I saw some people saying no, but a lot of people, I hear this, it's like, it's not just in my head, I'm not making it up. And it, you are not making it up. Pain is an aspect of consciousness though. Think about what happens when you go under anesthesia for surgery the tissues are still being damaged. They're being cut. The signals are still going up to the brain, but you're not conscious. If you're not conscious, you don't feel the pain. And that actually speaks to a lot of what we do. A lot of us want to just go unconscious, you know, and, and by the way, I should just say this now, um, as it's, you know, a few weeks from our election and no matter what side we're on, on the political spectrum, it doesn't matter. I think everyone is feeling a little bit of suffering <laughs> and we're all feeling a little bit of pain with the pandemic, with all of this going on in the world. The brain doesn't register the difference between psychological and emotional and physical pain. 
So when you say you feel pain, it is an experience, but it happens in the brain. So I, I just want to clarify that. So this is just the boring part of this talk, right? This is where you have some stimulus, something happens, you hammer your finger or you jam your finger in and it goes up. You don't have to know this pathway, but it goes to the spine and then it goes all the way up to the brain and it goes up to the thalamus. There is, if, if there's no pain until the signal reaches, I don't know if my cur you can see my cursor, this little part of your brain, the thalamocortical region, so if it gets blocked, and that's what nerve blocks are, that's what's, if it doesn't get up there, you won't feel pain. But pain is a creation of the brain. And it may or may not be associated with a nociceptive event. That means where you actually damage and it affects the nerve. So you can have damage to the nerve without pain, and you can have pain without a signal of that in the brain. So I think that's all important. Just to reiterate, you can have tissue damage and have no pain. You can have no tissue damage and pain. And tissue damage itself is neither a sufficient or necessary condition for pain. And how much a person is in pain may relate to the degree of pathology or not. So what am I saying here? It's you may, when you have pain, there's a difference between acute and chronic pain. Let me, let me just talk about that for a second. You know, this is a time factor in, in healthcare. Acute pain is less than three months usually. And there typically is tissue damage, but persistent, and sometimes I'll use that word, persistent or chronic pain is usually three or six months in length. And what's interesting to know is that 80 to 90% of people with chronic pain do not have any ongoing tissue damage. You hurt your back. Oh, you hurt your back. You fell on it. There was all this other stuff. But the actual tissue has healed and there's still pain because the signal is still going up to the brain. The signal is real. And it's typical after the resolution of damage. Now, I don't want you to hear that and saying, I'm saying, oh, you don't have tissue damage. Yes, you can. And here's the problem as a naturopath. As a naturopath, I said, we want to treat the cause. Naturopaths look at so many other factors. We look at diet, nutrition. We look at posture. We are trained in physical medicine, just like um, osteopaths and chiropractors. So whereas most MDs might not look at your spine and your extremities, unless they're an osteopath, uh, um, orthopedic surgeon or orthopedic doctor or physical therapist, we do. And that could be part of the damage. So when we say there's no tissue damage or metabolic disease, it, that's kind of an iffy issue uh, because it depends on who's looking and what's their frame of reference. But what happens when we have damage? And this is the important thing. So, so we have this acute damage. Something happens called neurotags. And I'm sorry if I put that picture there and any of you are cringing because I cringe every time I see it. So it, it, it's interesting, your, your whole body responds. And if your body is responding when you see that and you start to back away or tighten, by the way, that's what we're gonna be talking about when we talk about mind-body approaches. A neurotag is a complex pattern of nerves that all fire at the same time when you have some damage. So for example, um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a true story um, that elucidates this concept. I had a Ninja Blender. I don't know if any of you know about a Ninja Blender. Yeah, I've seen them. At, yeah. I have a Ninja Blender and I had a nice white porcelain sink. And one day I was making my smoothie and I was cleaning my Ninja Blender and I look down and my white porcelain sink was red. And my first thought was, did I put beets in my smoothie? I don't think I put beets in my smoothie. And I didn't put beets in my smoothie. Then I looked over and there was suds everywhere too. There was soapy water. And I looked down at my soapy hand and I see this blood pouring out of my finger. It was almost like a Monty Python routine. Um, this blood coming out of my, but soap was all over my hand. And then I felt the pain. So I want to be clear about that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen just for a second here. I want to be clear about that. Like I'd already cut my finger. There was soap all over my finger and I felt no pain. 
Then I looked at it and I screamed and I felt such pain. And I, I was like, my spouse comes running down the stairs. What happened? I was like, and there's blood all over. And then, you know, that gets into a whole other issue. Um, but I felt the pain. So here's an interesting thing. When I talk about those neuro tags, it's a complex thing. Every time I think of that ninja blender, I get nauseous. And I'm not, I, and I'm not being dramatic. I tend to be dramatic, but I'm not being dramatic when I say this. Like I put that ninja blender in the closet because when I thought of it, I started to get nauseous. My fingers healed. You can see the scar because it was a big scar, but it doesn't hurt. My finger doesn't hurt anymore, but I can still feel the reaction. When we have any event, this is psycho-emotional or physical, by the way. So it's not just about physical pain. It could be heartbreak, grief, loss. All of those can connect to that feeling of pain. When we have those experiences, it's more than one thing that's happening. You are making connections. And so I'm going to go back to share my slides um, right here, because when we are in pain, all of these areas of the brain light up. Our spinal cord, our thalamus, our hypothalamus, our sensory cortex, our amygdala. Our amygdala is the part of the brain that constantly says, am I safe? Am I safe? Am I safe? And when the amygdala is activated, we either do two things, which most of us know, we either mobilize, that's that fight or flight response. That fight or flight response when we don't feel safe, or some of us shut down, we pass out. Just like when I showed that blood, if you saw a needle, if any of you who see a needle pass out, that's immobilization. Your nervous system shuts down. So there's two different things that happen. But let, let me say that there's the amygdala, there's the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, which is about memory, the premotor cortex. You don't have to know all of these parts of the brain, but what I'm saying is when you have pain or a, a traumatic event specifically, a painful traumatic event, these areas all fire at the same time. So it's a collection of things. We don't just want to anesthetize the thalamus. That means because the premotor cortex is about movement and organization, whatever you were doing and physically doing at the time of pain, your body might start to do it again. How you concentrate and focus, your memory, just thinking about that image can stimulate a painful response. This is why we're talking about mind-body approaches because we can work on the mind and the body for this as well. So the Dalai Lama once said to, to lessen the suffering of pain, we need to make a very specific, a crucial distinction between the pain of pain and the pain we create about our thoughts about pain. One of the things I, I tell people is that in 2000 and when was that? 2006 to 2009, I participated in a joint study between University of Washington and Bassier University, where I did bedside hospice meditations. I've done over 500 bedside hospice meditations. Now we're talking about hospice. The life expectancy of people in hospice is about three and a half weeks. Although that's average. I worked with people who were alive for actually longer than the study, three and a half years. And people who live for three and a half weeks. So in the end of life, I've seen patients on IV morphine because of physical pain and on Ativan and all these different medications because of their psycho-emotional and physical pain. And what I taught them, and we're gonna go into that in just a moment, was certain breathing techniques. The thing that was the important part and why I bring that up is so talk about the pain we create by our thoughts of pain. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute about catastrophizing. I don't like that word. That is actually the standard word they use in medical healthcare. You know, uh, oh, is a pain, person a pain catastrophizer? Uh, I think it's kind of insulting. What it simply means is do you ruminate on the pain when you start to feel a sensation in your body? Have you become so concerned about pain happening? that then you start to tighten up against it. So any sensation makes it worse. So let me go on a little bit more. We're gonna start talking about these mind-body interventions. I wanna talk about 
this concept of hardiness in healthcare and hardiness. These are people who are more resilient to pain, to job loss. Now, these studies were done before a pandemic when we didn't have the opportunity to connect. I, so I think this is one of the downsides of the pandemic. Um, there's many others, of course. But the first thing about resilience, to build up our own personal resilience, is have a sense of commitment. And what do I mean by that? It means that you are committed to more than just one thing in your life. Many people I work with who have chronic pain or a chronic condition, medical condition, often tell me, I am my pain, or I am my diabetes, or I am hypertension. Likewise, and some people can say this, you know, it's like, I am a, a, an employee here. You know, this is what I do. This is my identity. When our identity is singular focused, we are less resilient. And individuals with breast cancer, those studies were on breast cancer, people with job loss, when people could identify that they are more, they, they had a, maybe a spiritual community, a group, something that they did, golfing, knitting group, any of these, a book club, when they had more than just one thing and didn't just identify with, in this case, the pain, they had this level of commitment. The other thing is they were committed to their healthcare. So if the doctor ever says, uh, you know, I'm in charge here, you know, no. Difficult patients, by the way, just so you know, difficult patients have a longer life expectancy. So be a difficult patient. And what is the definition in the medical literature of a difficult patient? You ask questions. Providers don't want you to ask questions. Ask questions, be difficult. Um, it's better for your health. Uh, that shows a level of commitment. The next part of hardiness was challenge. And this is the challenging piece, challenge. Challenge is this parameter that no matter what happens to you, no matter what happens to you, you can view it as a, something to learn from rather than a threat. And that's what I said before about the amygdala. When we view something as a challenge, I want to be clear, it's not about liking it. I don't want to insult any of us. I'm not saying you should just love your pain. I'm not saying love your medical conditions. That's just insulting, right? You don't have to like that you have pain. You don't have to like that this is happening. But how do you view it not as an enemy? The minute we make it an enemy, we can't accept this present moment. Now, maybe there's something you could do that will change it. Acupuncture, breathing, what we're going to do. But in the moment, it is present. How do you say, okay, how can I do it? The people who have the challenge parameter don't usually say, oh, I love it. They don't say, why me? They say, what now? Now, if you're asking, what did I do? Is there anything I did? That's different rather than going back on yourself and going, oh, why did I do this? Uh, because then you're making yourself an enemy. Your own behavior be has become a threat and you're judging yourself. And that activates the nervous system and it is not gonna lessen pain at all. Your muscles tighten, you release hormones that are stress-related hormones. The next thing was the control parameter. And the control parameter wasn't that you can control the environment, right? We've all learned this. We can't control, we can't control healthcare, we can't tra control traffic, we can't control government officials, we can't control. But what we can offer a modicum of control is how do we want to look at it? So control parameter actually goes back to challenge and commitment. How can I regulate? I like the word regulate rather than control. How can I regulate my nervous system? How can I regulate my moods? So how can I look at this as a, a challenge is part of the control parameter. And the last thing in the original research, it was just commitment, challenge, and control. But then new research came out and said, Really, the people who are the hardiest have a sense of community. And I'm going to say, as you all know, this is a really rough time right now. This is a rough time when we can't see my, our loved ones. My mother is in an assisted living facility. They're not letting people in. You know, she doesn't like FaceTime. <laughs> she doesn't like doing any of this because she doesn't want us to see her. But we could see her if we were there. That's interesting. Um, and I, I tell people, and it's interesting if you look at the studies with kids and teenagers, they don't call people anymore. They don't talk to people anymore. They text. Um, actually, my generation, you know, 
well, I'm in my mid fifties. So, you know, but I, I see that through every generation, people are not calling anymore. They're not talking. And what regulates our nervous system is hearing the human voice. So whether your screen is on or not, that's okay. Even if you can hear my voice, that can help regulate. As everyone knows, if you ever had a, a pet or a child or an infant who needed soothing, I, my cat, who just moments before spilled stuff all over my computer, by the way, you know, I picked up my cat. I could have said, oh, are you stupid cat? You know, and it would run away. But I picked him up and said, you stupid cat, I'm going to kill you. This is the second time you did it. And of course he purrs. We're no different. How do we regulate our nervous system? And that's interesting because that's one way to manage pain. Ooh, I am so upset about this. Can actually tighten everything up and create more cortisol in our body that uh, causes pain. Okay. So I'm gonna skip some of this for a second. Um, I guess my first question to you to talk about this mind-body medicine and mind-body approaches and solutions is what are you rehearsing? That's the word I use to people. People always look at me and scratch their head like, what do you mean rehearsing? When you think of your pain, whatever it is, what are you telling yourself? What are you rehearsing? So this is a questionnaire that some people ask is like, how painful would it be? How painful would that be? So just notice your immediate reactions when I say on a scale of one to 10, imagine you bump your shin on the hard edge, like for a glass table. Are you feeling it already? How painful would that be? What are you rehearsing? Imagine you burn your tongue on a very hot drink. How painful would that be? Imagine your muscles are slightly sore because you just uh, carried some, some groceries up the steps. Somebody dropped them off and you just walked up the steps or you just carried them from the elevator. Imagine you trap your finger in a drawer, which I did the other day too. How painful would that be? Imagine you have a mild sunburn on your shoulder. Imagine you graze your knee falling off your bike. Now, this is about rehearsal. We are rehearsing what we think. For an and it gets to what we call pain narratives. So say you exercised, you, you, there, uh, pandemic's over and you just go to a, a yoga class or a stretching class and you're in your chair and you're just doing some stretches in your chair, right? And you're doing some stretches in your chair I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. You're doing some things and you're stretching. And the next day you feel soreness in your muscles. You wake up and you go, ah, I exercise, that's good. That means that's health healthy. But what if you woke up in the day before you didn't stretch and you feel the same, the exact same intensity, pain. <gasps> What's wrong with me? Oh no, oh my God, is this a sign of COVID? Is this a sign of? If you've had that pain before, you might do that. So this is again, what I'm saying about what we rehearsing and what our pain narratives are. Um, so coming back to my slides, I don't think I usually use my slides. This is interesting. Um, what do you say when you have a pain? Oh, someday there will be a breakthrough for this and they'll cure it. So are you waiting for that? <laughs> I just haven't found the right doctor remedy and protocol. I wish people could see that I was sick so they won't, won't know, would know why I can't work. I've heard that. I don't dare go out and do things because people won't think that I'm really sick. I have heard this so many times. The PT told me that the cause of my pain was all the lifting I do at work, so I should stop lifting at work. So we have these narratives. So I want you to notice, okay, so here's like one of our first little practices here. So I'm gonna ring my bell. <laughs> And I'm gonna show images in a moment on the next sl slide. So just check in, notice your posture. Notice your muscle tension. Just scan your body, notice if there's any muscle tension anywhere. Notice your breathing, notice if you're breathing in your chest or your belly, notice if you're tightening around your breath. Notice any other sensations in your body. And now I'm going to have you look at the screen and when you see these things, notice what changes in your body. Traffic, invoices, 
waiting rooms. None of the first two, I think those two, the two on the corners, uh, left and left and bottom right corner aren't happening right now. Did you feel a change in your body? Now you might have said like traffic, well, I'm not feeling anything in my body because I haven't really traveled except down to the pet store and have things delivered. So I don't really go out. So I haven't seen traffic. So I'm like, oh, no effect. But waiting room, insurance policy, invoices, do you feel the change in your body? And what's happening right now? Guess what? I'm just showing you a picture. It's not happening. Now you might say, yes, but my invoice is on my desk and it is overdue. But it's just a thought. An image of this changed your nervous system. So let's do something different. Now imagine this, you are, there's two, two choices. Oh, I have both pictures on there. I'm sorry, just imagine you are here. You're at an all expense paid trip here. No one has COVID, all the food that you want, daily massages, perfect temperature. It's not too hot, not too cold. The other image of the lemon is, can you imagine, just take, uh, you can even close your eyes for a second. I imagine that you got an all expense paid trip to Italy and you're just wandering through a lemon orchard and your guide is taking you through and it's just a gentle breeze. And it's like, look at these lemons. And he pulls one that's so ripe, it's just ready to fall off the tree. He pulls it off and, and with his knife, he hands it to you. And you can feel it's still warm. It's still warm in your hand, it's sun-kissed. And while it's in your hand, he takes his little paring knife and he just cuts out, you're holding it, but he cuts out a little slice and the juice drips down your hand. And he invites you to bring that little slice. You take that slice in your other hand and you bring it up to your nose and you smell it. And then you take a bite of it or just put a drop of it on your tongue. Right now, I stop sharing my screen and you don't have to answer. I know I can see just a few of you. How many of you are salivating? How many is uh, salivating? Do you feel anything? Do you feel a change in your body? Is your mouth puckering at all? If your mouth is changing, if you are starting to salivate because you imagined a lemon, you're changing your hormones. You're changing your neurotransmitters in your body. That's salivary amylase that then goes down to the stomach and releases trypsin, chymotrypsin, pepsinogen, hydrochloric acid, helps you digest your food. And all we did, we're just, we're all sitting in our own rooms, right? <laughs> I'm sitting here in Lake Forest Park and I'm talking about an orchard in Italy. If we can do that, I wanna capitalize on that power. We can't do it all the time. So I'm asking you to think whenever you feel pain, what are you rehearsing? Where's your mind going? Are you already thinking of what is going to happen next? So coming back to this, you know, what happened in your mind body? And this is where I talked about the word catastrophizing. Again, I don't like it, but what it is, it's an exaggerated negative mental set brought to bear on an actual or an anticipated painful experience. So my back could start to twinge. And the very first thing I do is like, oh, no. And just when I do that, I am tensing up other muscles. I am bracing with my gut. I alter my breath and I'm rehearsing. I'm seeing, oh no, it's gonna get worse. If I'm telling myself it's going to get worse, I'm not in that, that lemon orchard. I'm not on that beach. So pain, catastrophizing, can contribute to the development or maintenance of anxiety, fear, depression, which is associated with pain. It's very hard to know in the research. Do people with pain have more depression and anxiety, or do people with more anxiety and depression have more pain? I think it doesn't really matter. I think they go hand in hand. What we're doing is we're mobilizing against a negative feeling. So we could have fear of the pain itself, fear of no treatment for the pain, fear that the pain is going to be chronic and will disable us, fear of the cause of pain, whatever that might be. Uh, we could have anxiety about the cause of pain. We could be angry 
because of how it's disrupted our life and changes our ability and that enhance our identity. And that's where the depression can be. We can have loss of identity. This is a great YouTube talk. It's by Lorimer Mosley, who's in Australia. Okay, I'm not going to try to do my Australian accent. But um, Lorimer Mosley, if any of you have access to watching a TED Talk, TEDx, Lorimer Mosley, he has two talks, but one is Why Things Hurt. In his 15-minute talk, he talks about walking. I'm going to tell the story just a little bit for a second. He tells a story about walking to go swimming, I believe. And he was walking and he went to go swimming. And the next thing he knows, he was in the hospital. And he was told he was bitten by one of the most venomous snakes in Australia. He's like, he has no recollection. He doesn't recall getting bit. Several months later, he's walking with his friends. They're hiking and he gets, the next thing he knows, he's on the ground grabbing his leg going, oh my God, the pain, oh, oh. And they said, what just happened? And he's like, you got scratched by a stick. And this is his example of neurotags. He doesn't have a memory of being bitten by a snake. How do you not have a memory of being bitten by a snake? I didn't have a memory of being cut by my ninja blender. But then because he's concerned about that, not even consciously, it's not even intentional. It's not that he tried to do this on purpose, but his body has become hypersensitive. His brain has become hypersensitive to feeling anything around his leg again his whole body, his, all those neurotags went into cascade. So again, I'm trying to say to you, when you have pain, it's not just a conscious thought. It's not just necessarily tissue damage. He asks his patients, all his patients, what in my life, in my thoughts, in my beliefs, in my behaviors, in my relationships implies threat? Because when I feel threat in my life, when I don't feel safe, I can have more pain. And what he asks everybody then to conversely think about it is what in my life, my thoughts, my beliefs, my relationships imply safety. How safe do I feel in my, pay, in, in my life? In 1997, this guy, Johannesson, did this study and he talked about integrated versus naked pain. And he points out that prior to aspirin, most of our pain was what we called integrated. The farmer was out on the farm. He was doing it and he was sore from the back. His back was sore from the day's work. And he went, oh, okay, I'm, uh, that's just part of life. It's integrated in part of my life. With the advent of aspirin, and do you remember like the commercial, I think it was Carly Simon or something. I haven't got time for the pain, you know, bear aspirin or something. And I haven't got time for the pain. We were all told that medication is going to set us free. If you have pain, you don't need to have pain. Let's just medicate it away. And the detriment is that it has seeped into our culture and become a pain narrative that I shouldn't have pain at all. Pain belongs to the medical world. Give me something for it. When in essence, pain is a natural thing for most of us. When we start to say pain is not natural and it's all medical, we actually elevate it to a threat. Then the pain itself becomes the threat. Then we start to contract when we feel the minute minus minuscule amount of pain. So Joseph, Joseph Sarno, John Sarno, John Sarno um, was a uh, doctor. He was an orthopedic surgeon in New York. I think it was Mount Sinai, but I don't know for sure. And he worked with tons of patients with pain because he was an orthopedic surgeon, he would do MRIs. He did tons of MRIs and said, oh, they have compressed nerves, their discs are shortened, and that's the reason they had pain. Well, then he started to examine the backs of people who were the same age, 30, 40, 50, who had no back pain. They did not report any back pain. I know there's a lot on the slide. You don't have to know that. But what the essence of this is, they showed nerve root compression and slip discs in people with no pain whatsoever. And what Sarno said, going back to Sarno, he's like, wait a minute. What if this isn't the cause of the back pain? That's what I've been taught. That's what I've been doing surgery on. And anybody who goes to an orthopedic surgeon will know, you can even ask this to a surgeon. If you want to have chronic pain, if you want to have chronic back pain, have back surgery. 
It is a, a thing that they do say. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't have back pain. Sarno said, yes, 5% of my patients absolutely needed the surgery. Yeah, so that doesn't mean you shouldn't have back surgery, I should say, or any surgery. Um, so what Sarno says is, and it goes back to everything I've said, you could read this book and you're gonna get just these few messages. We all are already feeling unsafe in the world. We feel upset about something. He's not saying it's in your head. You're already stressed about something and your muscles are already tight. He calls it myositis. That's just a fancy word for inflammation of the muscles. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> he made it, you know. Your muscles are already tight and then you go over to pick something up and it hurts. And yeah, you pulled something. Sarno's approach, now this is very, um, very extreme, but he said, don't treat the pain. The more you say, okay, I got to fix the pain, it takes you away from the real issue. And it goes back, if I may, to Laura Mosley's comment, it goes back to what in my life feels threatening? What in my life feels safe? Wow. And I would like to point out that right now in the world, there's a lot that feels threatening. So Sarno says, stop treating the pain. Oh, he does agree with getting acupuncture and massage. Yes, please do that. And I think that massage, weekly massage should be on the universal health plan for everyone. I really do, because we just because of posture. Um, so I'm going to skip. There's a bunch of other studies. These studies are really fascinating because they're about collisions and, and um, motor vehicle accidents. Like in Norway, I'm sorry, is it Norway? Uh, I can't remember which country. It's not really relevant at the moment. I don't know if it's Finland. Um, but what they're saying here is that in certain countries, at 40 mile, mile an hour rear collision, there's absolutely no incidence of whiplash compared to the United States. But let's think about the pain narrative again. What do we do? I, I just fell down the stairs because my cat, that's another story. I fell down the stairs and I slipped and fell on my back. What do all of us do? Oh, you don't have back pain right now. You don't have neck pain right now, but watch out for 48 hours. So what do we do? We make all of us hypervigilant. So I start going, oh, okay, wait, wait, is that in my neck? Oh, does that hurt? Okay, wait, wait, is that getting tight? And when I do that, I start bracing just to like, I'm gonna stop sharing for it again. So what do I do? I go, oh no, oh no, is that, is that pain? And I tighten. And guess what that does? That pulls my neck and makes it worse. I hold my breath. And every time you hold your breath, by the way, every time you take a breath in and hold your breath, you're increasing your heart rate. If you ever wanna work on slowly, slowing down your heart rate, exhale slowly. We'll get to that, that's in the slides in a minute. So the narrative that we have in this country about whiplash, and I have it too, I couldn't get out of it, is, <gasps> oh, is that, watch out for 48 hours. Now, here's a website. Uh, this is the website. It's neuroplasticsstix.com. This is the work of Moskowitz. Um, and very interesting guy. He's been written up in several books. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one book. Uh, Norman Deutsch has, Deutsch has written about him. And he has two great books about the brain that changes itself and the brain's way of healing talking about the plasticity of the brain. One of the things Moskowitz does is he shows all his patients with chronic pain, these slides. These are MRI images of people with acute pain. In acute pain, these areas, remember those neuro tags that I talked about? They're in different areas. These areas of the brain light, light up if you cut your finger. Okay, but after three months, it can become this. They get stronger. These areas light up even more. It's the same areas. So he shows his patients this pay picture and then you know this pay picture. And then he shows them a third image. And this is when you have no pain. Now, this might be a technique. If you love visualization, if you had a strong, if you had a strong reaction to lemons or the beach, I would ask you to go to neuroplastics.com. Go to that. And I can even give you copies of the slides. We can talk about that if, I don't know how we can do that. But um, if you want copies of the slides, you could get these images, but you could go on his website. And he has people with chronic pain close their eyes 
He has them feel the area of their pain and imagine this is your brain. Imagine this is what's happening in your brain. And then he has you imagine whichever way you want that you turn down the dial and then you turn dial the, down the dial again. Very simple meditation. I have used this with several of my patients who really love guided imagery and found that those who like imagery, it works well. If you're one of those individuals like, I can't imagine my brain at all. This isn't gonna work for you. There was a patient that was in the, the book that I showed by Norman Doidge who had such debil debilitating pain, she couldn't get out of her bed. She like a year ago, she was active and she was in her forties and she was a workaholic, which is part of the issue but then she couldn't get out of her bed at all. So she said she spent two hours doing this every day, imagining this and going there. And the image that I do for my, myself is I imagine a watering can. I imagine when I feel pain, I just imagine pouring a watering can over my brain and turning the fire down. And some days I'm sitting there and the fire just stays right there. But I imagine turning it down and turning it down and trying to turn it down till I can get to here and then I can get to here. What we're doing here is not catastrophizing our pain. When we do this, it's almost a mindfulness technique. We're feeling the pain and we're not contracting against it. And it's very important. There's other studies on meditation and which areas of the brain when we keep thinking. I, I just show these slides to give some power. If you're resting and you feel the pain and you're just catastrophizing, the pain increases. But when you start to meditate on the pain, saying the pain is present, pain is present, I don't have to do anything against it. I'm going to soften and imagine breathing into it. It can change. So I want you to think about what are you rehearsing with the pain? I know that that's, uh, I don't want that to feel like there's a judgment in here. One way to do meditation and do a meditation on the pain is just to feel the pain, which is pre-verbal, and then describe the sensation. When you say it's the worst thing in the world, that's what my mom will say. This is the worst thing. And my sister and I just shrug because my mom has said for three and a half years, this is the worst pain. This time it's the worst in the world. I am not discounting that it's not painful. I know it is. Um, but every time she says it, she's not, she's moving away from the sensation. What I didn't say in this talk is that pain has specific fibers. Have you ever like, when you bumped your, your arm or something, you start to rub it. Um, you know, when you bump into something and you start to rub it and the rubbing feels good. That's because pressure is a different pathway than pain. Have you ever put ice cubes on it? Yes, you could put ice to stop the inflammation, but you put the ice on because cold and hot are different pathways than the pain. And when you do that, when you use things like icy hot or essential oils, you're actually interrupting the signal. So the signal of the pain can't get to the brain. This is why massage works so well. My acupuncturist puts on these heated packs of uh, certain um, oils on my back. And then I don't feel the pain. That's what I did after I fell. I, I actually got some of those. And so I feel the warmth. I can't feel the pain. They compete. They're different pathways. And if it doesn't get to the brain, I don't have an experience of pain. So when we describe our pain, we're going into the sensation and just meditating on that. Can you focus on it without judgment? That's what mindfulness is. It's being present to the experience without any judgment whatsoever. So it's so. what do I mean? Pain has multiple pathways. Is it a sharp pain? Is it a dull pain? That's a different pathway. Is it cutting or is it burning? That's a different pathway. When you get to describe it, you can lessen your narrative about it and decrease your reaction. So that's just one thing. So. Moskowitz's work in neuroplastics talks about describe the pain, sensation of pain. Just stay with the sensation. Notice the difference between the sensation of the pain versus your feelings of anxiety and fear, your trepidation, your narrative about what's going to be happening. And then what he says to practice is think of 
someone or something you love without question. Now I work with a lot of PTSD. I work with a lot of trauma and I have some friends who work at the VA. One of the things they say to patients in the VA to soothe them is to think of something you love without question. The number one thing people think of, not their family, their pets. So even though my cat knocked over my tea, and even though my cat spilled stuff and tripped me, you know, I love my cat. And when I think of that love, when I get into that feeling of love, it regulates my nervous system. So another neuroplastic t- t- uh, plastics tip I said is to touch, massage. So many times we wait for other people to massage us. You know, I, we're going to be waiting a long time right now for some, but you can even do hand massage. And I encourage you when you feel pain to start do it, unless your pain, hands are painful, but you can still do that. But touch also includes that hydrotherapy that you putting something in a nice warm bath, doing different things with, with um, that touch of hot and cold can help you decrease your pain. And it doesn't even have to be on the same area. It's better if it's on the same area. Another thing that has a different impact is smell. And I don't know if you guys have essential oils or if you use essential oils. There's only two synapses from your nose to your brain. All these other ones are much more. And as we know, smell is so powerful. You smell that and I go, I'm at my grandma's house. I get the image instantly. And nobody makes chicken soup like my grandmother. Not even my mom did. Um, So smell is also useful. Smells like peppermint and, and lavender but whatever your favorite is can actually net mitigate your pain. And then another thing that's really interesting is humming and chanting. Um, there are studies that show, so how many of you like when you have pain, do you start to moan? I moan, you know, <laughs> see some people raising their um, You know, something like, oh God, they're moaning again. It actually regulates your nervous system to hum. I might not say moan, but just to, um, and extend that breath when you're in pain. So if you're in pain, some people might not like that you're moaning. They might pick on you for that. But just to, and the, the, the hum has to be with a closed lips. It can't be like a hum. When you close your mouth, mm, you actually cause more stimulation in the sinuses First of all, it will actually help open up your airways, by the way. And it actually stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system that causes you to calm and soothe. When you take these longer exhales, so you take in not a huge breath, you don't go, (gasps) but when you take a nice breath in and then hum. And any of you who've chanted, if you've done any chanting, you can think of Om. You can think of prayer. You know, uh, Shalom, Om, Amen. All of those, use those words. There's been studies that show people who do the rosary actually regulate their nervous system, just be, even if they're doing it silently. And that, what I mean regulate the nervous system is when we're in pain, we're often, again, with our narrative, we're tightening up against it and we're activating our sympathetic nervous system. And when we release cortisol, when we release epinephrine, that is not gonna help with our pain. It's actually going to make the pain worse. I just thought of like the last time I went to the dentist, pre-COVID, and I I only have one cavity in my whole life, you know? But I go in and I always tighten. And I know that tightening my neck is not gonna help. So when, and if they're doing some cleaning and it does hurt a little bit, if I can learn to just soften and breathe into it, I can lessen the pain because tightening just increased the pain. So I realize what time it is. Um, That's the most of my slides. Um, I wanna open it up to know if there's questions. This is just a brief overview. Each of these topics we could have gone into in much more depth. I could even talk about how to breathe for hypertension and all of that, so much more that we can talk about. But I wanted to give you a big, overview of like looking at main takeaways. What are you rehearsing? What's the narrative you have? Can you learn to lessen your pain, soften when you feel it? 
So Dr. Any, Red. Yes. So this is Larry and David over here. We, uh, we're getting ready for this Zoom event. We have, we're feeling the anxiety of making sure technology works and this and that. How does pain and anxiety relate to each other? Great question. You know, anxiety, we talk about this, you know, because having worked with trauma all the time, we talk about the sympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight response. That's not a bad response. If the fire, if the, if, if, I don't mean fires outside, but if the building's on fire, I, I hope you get anxious and mobilize. Unless you're saying, ah, oh, today it's enough, I'm done. I'll go down with the building, you know. But what it does, so you're, it's before this, this event, you're starting to go, oh my gosh, what, I hope everything works. What it does is it, it, it floods your brain so that you have the energy to move. Now, the problem for most of us, because we're mammals, we don't know how to shut it off. And a mere thought about it can go from zero to 120. So some sympathetic activation, some fight, it's not fight or flight so much, but it's some sympathetic activation is necessary. I'm engaged as I'm talking to you. As you can see, I get excited about this stuff. I love sharing this stuff. So my nervous system is elevated. It's amped up a little bit, but I'm not feeling threatened. I don't feel a threat. But as I told Larry and David before this, my cat did knock over my tea, all my whole full cup of tea all over this. You should have seen me mobilize. I jumped really quick. And then I kept saying to myself, breathe. Because that's what we do to protect. We're still mammals and we're, we're still responding to threat. Like if I'm a few minutes late to the call, no one's going to die. But my nervous system doesn't know that. So in order for us to rewire our nervous system, we have to practice identifying how much of a threat is something learning to soften and pain is intrinsically linked to that anxiety. We will feel it because it helps mobilize us to do something. Many times there's nothing to do. So as the Dalai Lama said, we have to recognize the difference when if there's a problem to solve, solve the problem. If you have a knife in your back, pull it out. Well, you know, depending on where it is, but, but if you can't pull it out, that's the thing. If you can't pull it out, how do you learn to soften into it? But if you can pull it out, pull it out. I mean, by all means, you know, um, that's what I teach people. So without going, oh my God, I got to get it out now. I got to get it out now. I got to get it out now. I got to get, it's like, okay. Can you help me? So I don't know if I answered the question. I'm trying to say that we mobilization isn't wrong. Anxiety isn't bad. It says we need to do something, but then we have to step back and go, well, is there anything I actually can do? Very good, thank you. Other questions? I would also like to add that um, on my website, my, it's not a shameless plug for myself, my website, The Breath Space, um, thebreathspace.com, uh, I have lots of resources. I do have a number of guided meditations people can listen to. Um, there's a meditation page. You can listen to these meditations. Um, there's uh, some videos on there as well. Um, and I do, I do twice weekly guided meditation through Zoom. On my website, on that meditation page, there's a link and you can just click in every, every Tuesday and Thursday at eight o'clock in the morning. I do a 20 minute meditation. So Anybody who's interested can show up. It's free. I don't charge. It's just, and can sometimes we talk about can mindfulness. You that again? The, can you repeat the website again? Um, yes, I, I actually can. I will actually put it uh, up here for you. Uh, I'll share my screen one more time and just go to thebreathspace.com. The breath space. We can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me? Can't hear you. Call from Bravo. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, my microphone just stopped working. So, um, thank you. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Um, yeah.
All right. Any questions? Do we have any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Oh, wait, we have a question. Mute. Um, just a, a simple question. Um, so responding to threats, I find yeah. myself anymore re responding to um, jerks, people that are just like, you know, you're pulling in front of me and there's no turn signal. I mean, those kind of like people like, and I get very upset and it's like, I can't do anything about it. What can I do to kind of just to get out of that space? I try, but I get so like, like they're doing it to me on purpose when I know they're not, they're just jerks. Yes, and we know that. That is the thing. It's like the world was not created for me. You know, it's like, it sounds like everyone, everything went wrong today and my cat is out to get me. That person's out to get me. And, I, and we know that is consciously not true. So one thing that we can do is practice. First of all, the, let me step back. The other thing is notice how you're hyper, hyper, hypersensitive to that. Mm -hmm. What actually led us to feel hypersensitive? If I didn't sleep well, if I had a bad day, if something else happened, if something political happened, if there's fires outside and I can't breathe, we are going to be more sensitive. So the first thing is be compassionate with ourselves. To really connect with ourselves and say, wow, I'm really getting irritated with everybody. No, that doesn't let us off the hook. That doesn't mean we should slam into the next person. But we say, oh, wow, okay, part of it is what's going on for me. I'm oversensitive at the moment. The next thing to do is then in order to have acceptance of the moment, what we call radical acceptance is recognize everybody's behaving because of their conditioning. Everybody is responding in the world because they don't feel safe or healthy or at peace. <clears throat> And I say this, and I know this is a triggering thing to say, um, but it's some people believe a wall will keep us safe and others pe people believe a wall will not keep us safe. We don't, dis we don't agree with the behavior, but if we can recognize that everybody's doing it for some reason to feel safe. So just thinking about <laughs> marital relationships or kid, if you have kids, you know, it's like, why did they leave that dish in the sink? How many times? They didn't leave the dish in the sink because, well, sometimes they do, but they didn't leave the dish in the sink to irritate you. They just don't see it as the same thing. Man, that's I, that's I grew good. up, I grew up with a mother, a nice, good Jewish mother, right? Who I would put a dish in the sink and she'd be over there. She would not turn around and she said, is that where that goes? <laughs> And you could feel it. It's like her eyes came through her head. And, you know, being the baby, of course, I said, yes, it is. Um, so I was trained. I was conditioned. I was hardwired at an early age that put the dishes in the sink. So now if anyone doesn't do that, I'm like, what the heck? You know, but, it's not, but their mother was different than mine. So... I actually recite that, sadly, on a daily basis in my house and other places that everybody's responding because they don't feel safe. They don't see the world the same way. That's the way it looks. And that helps me. But it's a daily practice. I'm sorry, I haven't perfected it. And the, and the Dalai Lama, I keep talking about the Dalai Lama, one of my spiritual teachers, but the Dalai Lama says, you know, oh, he practices this every single day. He wakes up at 4.30 every day to meditate on how he wants to be that day. And I'm thinking, sir, you got it already. So we'd like to think, oh, I get it once and I'm done. Uh, Thank you. Sure. Now, Dr. Bray, we went over five minutes, but do you have one more question that can, I can ask you? Yep, I'm fine. So you mentioned the dentist uh, earlier in the week that I broke a tooth. Oh, and, yeah. uh, and I started, uh, thankfully, I got my dental appointment and I'm driving to the dentist and all of a sudden I'm throbbing. My tooth is throbbing. I'm feeling like he's going to lay me in the chair. I don't like to be laid out all the way. He's going to put stuff in my mouth. He's going to do all these things. And I started getting this pain, you know, tightening pain all over until uh, the very end, I said, this is a good thing. And this is going to help me. That's the, the end result. So um, I was able to relax and do that. But, but how do you, but that's how, it. How do you help people? Like, it's not so bad that 
you're going to help. If you didn't go, you would have a pain and you, you wouldn't be able, to be able to function. But the whole thing is how do you talk yourself into it versus talk yourself out of it? Well, uh, that's a huge question, but I really love that example. I'm glad you said that example because I, I want you to recognize that that demonstrates everything I was talking about. Mm -hmm. That you feel the pain and you're already rehearsing what's going to happen. And we think we're doing it to take care of ourselves. We think I'm like, if I, I know what's going to happen, then I'll be okay. But you're in your car. You're not over there. It's interesting how many people I know who've broken a tooth during this pandemic, but huh. you're already rehearsing it. The, the thing to do is then one, pull back like you did. It's going to help. So you reframe the narrative. You switch the narrative. This is going to help. And so then it was inviting. You didn't have to react to it. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. The other thing was um, that, you know, then you just said, okay, phew, my question is to be here now. I know that's a, a, we've heard that phrase all the time, be in your car, be where you are, notice where you're tightening around it and soften. Um, your question I think was asking, how do I know, go and do it instead of avoiding it? Is that, is that the question? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's a nuanced conversation by going back to the person and saying, what are you afraid of? Because then it's like, because we could say, it's going to help. It's going to help. No, it's not. It's going to hurt. It's like, okay, well, what is the fear that's going to happen? The fear of something going wrong, like going over a bridge or taking a, uh, you know, a height or something like that. These things, you look at what can go wrong versus what can go right first. And then I have, I ask people about how much evidence do you have of that? How many times? And, and as any of you know, you have one event that, that's traumatic, then you don't want to do that thing again. But how many other events do you have that, that are positive for the same thing? You know, having worked in hospice, that's a cheap one. I know I'm going to say it. I'm not trying to manipulate here, but having worked in hospice and working with patients, talking about how do you want to live? How do you want to live while you're waiting for what's the next, next going to happen? And that's my question to all of us. How do we want to live? You know, and, and fear is not a bad thing. Like if you're saying, huh, I'm in an at-risk population. Do I really want to do this? There's a difference between saying, you know what? I'm going to shelter in place. I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to wear, you know, I'm going to do this. And you can soften into it versus, God, do I have my mask? Oh my God. I'm not going to help. So it is a real nuanced conversation about what is, on, are you imagining? What are you rehearsing? How safe do you feel? Well, I encourage everyone to go to your website. You're very calming. I checked my uh, iWatch. My heartbeat was up at the beginning and now it's in the calm mode. So uh, thank you for all that. And thank you for today. And thank you all for joining. We thank you. Uh, oh, there's some thank yous out thank there. Thank you, Jody. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time to visit with us today and give us some great, uh, concepts. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all.